A tweet from Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian has made headlines. It led Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison to demand an apology, but China refused to do so. This is the latest incident in the turbulent relationship between the two countries. The question is, was Zhao Lijian's tweet appropriate? What about the killing of Afghan civilians that Zhao Lijian highlighted? Can anything stop the free fall of China-Australian relations? To answer these questions, we are joined by Victor Gao, Chair Professor at Suzhou University, Marcus Rubenstein, Editor at APAC News in Sydney, Australia, Professor Chen Hong of the East China Normal University in Shanghai, and Andy Mock, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. Welcome, gentlemen. That is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Wang Guan. Marcus in Sydney, Australia, why don't I go to you first? I mean, was it appropriate, in your opinion, to use a cartoon character to highlight uh, the issue of the killing of Afghan civilians by Australian soldiers? Should Zhao apologize as Australia demanded? Look, I don't think it was appropriate. And I think the, the central reason is that uh, a small number of Australian troops engaged in, in a, an abhorrent uh, act. Now, charges may well be laid, but, but I think the reality is it's almost certain Australian troops have engaged you know, in war crimes. And what they've done uh, is abhorrent to a nation. It's not representative of the Australian people. Uh, and most Australians are, are absolutely disgusted in that behaviour. Now, in terms of uh, uncovering those crimes, uh, the Australian media has a great deal to answer to in, 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 uh, in amplifying you know, ridiculous uh, criticisms of China. But in fairness to the mainstream media, uh, they were the ones who uncovered this. And as, you know, as we call ourselves uh, you know, a free and fair democracy and a liberal democracy, the case of, of Julian Assange, who is in jail in the United, in the United Kingdom, uh, Edward Snowden, who's in effective exile in, in Russia, there are very, very serious consequences for Western journalists uh, who expose the wrongdoing of our own military. Now, so journalists accepted those risks and they were brave enough to do the stories. Uh, beyond that, um, these stories came to light because fellow soldiers uh, st uh, stepped forward. These were soldiers who, for whatever reason, the chain of command, they were getting no results, so they went forward to the mm -hmm. media. And that's right. an incredibly brave thing for them to do. Right. Uh, they, uh, they, risked, they put their careers at an end. Some of them felt as though they, they were risking their lives. A and I think from an Australian perspective, yeah. these are the people uh, who should be applauded. So yes, these were an, uh, an apparent act on the parts of Australians, but they were uncovered and they were held to account by Australians. And I think the problem with this tweet is it, is it uh, and, and because t Twitter in itself is such a, a brief uh, platform, it's open to interpretation, it leaves an interpretation that maybe all Australians are culpable, and it's not. It's just a, a very few. Uh, look, I personally think an apology is in order. Uh, I think before an apology comes, I think the diplomats need to speak behind closed doors uh, and discuss what the, the terms, what the nature, how it will happen. It, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, you know a, 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 a shameful apology mm -hmm. on one side or another. Right. But I would say, if it does come from the Chinese end, there's an absolute obligation on Australia, be it Prime Minister Morrison or our Foreign Minister Maurice Payne, to accept that, poli uh, that apology with absolute grace, with humility. Uh, oh, wow. Do not try to, to demonise China about it and say, this is a point at where megaphone diplomacy ends, we must build and, and rebuild this important relationship between, uh, between our two countries. Right, Marcus, countries I want to go to our guests in Beijing to, to uh, get their response you know, about all this. Um, if I may, Victor, uh, what do you think about to the way Zhao Lijian exposed the, the wrongdoing of Australian soldiers in Afghanistan? Should he apologize? Well, there are several aspects to this uh, episode. One is, let's look at the facts. It is indeed a fact uh, reported and verified uh, that there are Australian soldiers committing war crimes in Afghanistan. And I would say we need to give the Australian government, the military high command, a credit for their bravery in exposing this very heinous crime committed by some of the Australian soldiers. 
The second point is that the international community, including China, including Australia, including the Australian Prime Minister, should really leave no stone unturned in condemning such war crimes committed by some Australian soldiers. And I think the third point is very important. It is actually a computer graphic created by a Chinese artist that Mr. Zhao Lijing was sending through his uh, 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 internet um, platform. And this is completely freedom of expression for this particular Chinese artist to uh, describe the situation as he saw it. And it is also completely within the job description of Mr. Zhao Lijian, who is a spokesperson of the foreign ministry, to talk about the heinous crime committed by some of the Australian soldiers. This is not equating the crimes committed by the Australian soldiers to, for example, the whole nation of Australia. I think in China there is tremendous amount of respect among the Chinese people for the Australian people. The Chinese people and the Australian people can get along with each other very well. And I don't think the Prime Minister of Australia should bark at the wrong tree. I think he can spend time more meaningfully by condemning these heinous war crimes committed by some of the Australian soldiers rather than diverting the attention to this particular computer graphic. Now, the fourth point, allow me to mention, is that this same Chinese computer designer, the artist, created another computer graphic about what Prime Minister Morris, Morrison was doing in Barking at the Wrong Tree. And I think the whole international community should have the benefit of this new graphic created on December the 1st because it illustrates once again how a Chinese artist would see what's going on. I think let's focus on the war crime, let's condemn it, and let's don't bark at the wrong tree, and let's do not allow the Prime Minister of Australia to bark at the wrong tree. Mm -hmm. Professor Chen Hong in Shanghai, uh, you followed China-Australia relations uh, for a long, long time. Uh, what do you think? I mean, which side should apologize at this point? Yes, firstly, I should say that I do not agree that uh, uh, the cases that you ha which have been reported in the Brereton report were isolated cases, as the first speaker was mentioning, that uh, you know, uh, those, those things were simply you know, cases that were happening, you know, you know, committed by a number of, you know, uh, well, a limited number of um, uh, members of the uh, Australian Army. Because in the uh, Brazilian report, such acts, such as atrocities, have been you know, described as a kind of culture in the army. This is not a kind of like a single you know, individual soldiers committing isolated crimes. These were actually regarded as soldiers. They, uh, those soldiers were actually required and requested to commit their first kill and they want to blood the uh, uh, blood, you know, blood was used as a as a kind of verb, you know, to 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 uh, to do the uh, the first blood. So these are actually, you know, what actually should be drawing our attention and also the attention of the international community. On the other hand, of course, I think Mr. Morrison was making a very, you know, clever, cunning, you know, uh, 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 misnaming of these uh, two uh, facts because actually what we are actually witnessing looking at uh, Zhao Lijian's uh, repost was actually a uh, as, as the second speaker was uh, saying as uh, uh, Professor Gao was saying that it was computer generated graphic in other words it is a piece of artwork not as Mr. Morrison was saying as a kind of like a faked photo he was deliberately misleading the public as uh, into believing that this was faked by the Chinese government to be, you know, misleading the uh, international, you know, uh, community's understanding of the uh, incidents that was happening unfolding in uh, uh, Afghanistan. That was actually very deliberately, you know, to be uh, disinforming, you know, the uh, public. Uh, the uh, artwork and also uh, the uh, f faked photos are totally different, different things. A piece of artwork actually has got a, a you know, particular theme and it is meant to express the feelings and also ideas and concepts of uh, the artist. While the, on the other hand, a faked photo is designed to, is made actually, you know, is simply, you know, is faked, is made to mislead mm -hmm, right. and also to, to, dis uh, to uh, dis uh, disinform. The, these are actually two, definitely two different things. Well, Andy in Beijing, let me go to you. I mean, some Western countries, such as France, who recently, uh, most recently, act actually today, criticized China about all this, uh, often use a cartoon characters, for example, to depict, depict real issues of our times. And they call this freedom of expression, freedom of speech. 
even freedom to character. But when the Chinese artist does this, it's called a distortion of facts. Uh, is there a Western double standards here? Well, I think there absolutely is a double standard and really a disappointing level of hypocrisy with this. Um, but I also want to say that I think it's not surprising that Zhao Lijian's tweet so unnerved uh, Scott Morrison because this does have the potential to become a public relations and a political crisis for the Australian Prime Minister. And I think we're seeing this uh, unfold now because what this tweet actually does is it presents very graphically to the Australian public the dreadful moral cost of Australia being at the beck and call of the United States. So how does this play in? So I agree that this is, these are not isolated incidents and this is part of a larger culture, a larger strategic stance that is deliberately chosen by the Scott Morrison government, well earlier than that, but chosen by the Australian government. And we see that France has criticized this, but more recently uh, the US and the UK have fallen in line defending Australia against Chinese quote unquote disinformation. But the reality is that these are horrific crimes against humanity. And it's not just, I think, Australia that is uh, engaging in this mm -hmm. double standard, but other countries as well. Well, uh, thanks, Andy. Thanks uh, for your explanation. I appreciate that. Uh, let's look at some comments online. Our viewers are sending in their comments about this issue. Uh, lots of uh, discussions on this issue. Jim Mello said this, here's my take on the tweet. The whole saga is pathetic on our part and we should do something to make good on our, way, our war crimes instead of screaming about it. The resulting criticism of China's human rights record ironically misses our own hypocrisy. Um, Marcus, let me go to you. Uh, I want to talk about the public perception. Uh, of Aussies towards the Chinese. Uh, this may sound like a chicken egg problem, but which comes first? I mean, the Australian public's negative perception towards China or Prime Minister Morrison's government's top stance and steering of national conversations towards an anti-China uh, sentiment? Now, look, if, if I can go back to uh, what I said at the start, I, I didn't say these were isolated incidents. Uh, you know, my personal opinion that of, of many people is that this is a, you know, an absurd war to have spent more time in Afghanistan than the combined total of, uh, of, of World War II and World War I and, and, and effectively achieved very little, uh, if anything. Uh, I don't support the war. I never have. I don't think Australia should have been there. Um, but that being said, there were 20,000 Australian troops who served there and, and a handful, perhaps several dozen, uh, committed these atrocities, but I go back to my original point. They were exposed by Australians. Uh, so uh, I, I think that that's the issue. Now, of course, this comes uh, in, uh, in the backdrop of, of a, a wider uh, worsening of uh, diplomatic relations between Australia and China. I, I will say this, prior uh, to, to, to Zhao's tweet earlier this week, uh, the public opinion in Australia was very much against the actions of these armed forces. They had no widespread support in Australia. The most Australians, the overwhelming majority of Australians were absolutely disgusted uh, and shamed by this uh, and wanted no part of it. So, uh, and I think that that's one of the problems that I have w with the tweet. The suggestion that, that Australians you know, accepted this, they don't. It's disgusting behaviour. I don't accept it and, and any decent Australian does. It, does. Mm -hmm. Now I think Scott Morrison has hopelessly mishandled Australia's relations with China. He's been led by, uh, by the, the security of the defence establishment. Uh, the diplomats have, have been sidelined uh, in this whole debate. But in fairness to Morrison, he did, he did apologise uh, to the Afghan, he rang up the Afghan president, uh, Angus Campbell, the chief of the armed uh, of the defence force, who made the announcement of these reports findings. He unreservedly apologised. So they did apologise. I think what's happened now is people who were Australians who were justifiably uh, angered uh, at the actions of a few soldiers have now all of a sudden become polarised and, and, and they're now angry at China for buying into this argument. 
And in terms of the media, uh, the, the media has now turned on China. Uh, and, and it's and they're bringing it forward those old usual lies, you know, China human rights, Hong Kong, South China Sea. Um, we've seen in the last two days the more extreme media elements, and by more extreme I say Murdoch media, uh, and now they're rehashing the the ridiculous, absurd Wuhan laboratory. Uh, COVID-19 uh, th conspiracies that the Chinese government somehow managed this terrible virus and unleashed it on the world. Okay. And that's what's happened. That's what's happening on the ground here in Australia. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, you know, there are a great many Australians you know, in business, in education, in tourism, who have wonderful relations with, 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 right, certainly with China those and relationships Chinese people are taking and appreciate Chinese culture. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, Marcus, exactly. they're, they're, yeah, I'm sorry to touch you there, it, but... And they're um, taking a hit yeah, because of a minority hit. of people. Unfortunately. Um, but let me go to Victor uh, for this moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Victor, I mean, what can be done to really stop the freefall of China-Aussie relations? Well, first of all, I think all of us need to do the right thing. And I would say of top priority right now is to condemn the atrocities and the war crimes committed by some Australian soldiers in Afga Afghanistan. And I think the fact that the Afghan government is now expressing appreciation for China raising this issue with Af uh, Australia speaks very uh, loudly about what's the right thing and what's the wrong thing. Secondly, I think the whole Australian nation need to unite to condemn such atrocities and need to recommit themselves never to do the same thing, never to allow any single Australian soldier to commit such war crime anywhere in the world. And that's the right thing. Now, for China, we need to do the right thing. We need to condemn such Australian soldiers' atrocities. But we also need to pay a premium, put a premium on nurturing China-Australian relations. After all, the Chinese people and the Australian people are friendly towards each other, and they need to get along. Now, another point, allow me to emphasize. Uh, the previous uh, panelists, whom I respect, mentioned the uh, discussions in Australia now about uh, the uh, COVID-19 virus. It is very important to note that the Wall Street Journal reported findings by CDC in the United States that the COVID-19 virus existed in the United States as early as December 2019, if not earlier. That's very, very important, and I hope Australian government, Australian people, Australian media need to report this. You really need to educate yourself about the realities, about where this origin of the virus really came from. It did not originate in China. China was the first country brave enough to use science to report about the occurrence of this virus, to identify this virus. China was doing a big favor to itself, to the Chinese nation, and to mankind as a whole by becoming the first nation to identify this deadly virus. So, Australia, listen to what Wall Street Journal is reporting about what CDC of the United States is finding. This is truly very, very important. Right. Uh, Professor Chen, uh, of course, uh, China-Australia relations are multifaceted. Uh, Scott Morrison, the, the Prime Minister of Australia, said this recently about his approach with China. He, has, he said that uh, Australia has a dual mandate when it comes to dealing with China. On one hand, he needs to maintain Australia's values and interests. At the same time, maintain a mutually beneficial trading relationship with China. What do you make of Morrison's uh, position? Well, for all the years that Morrison had been in power, after I, he, I, I, I think he had been, you know, consistently and I should say successfully, you know, uh, been damaging the uh, bilateral relations between China and Australia, which used to be, you know, mutually beneficial, which used to be, you know, such a constructive partnership between the two countries. But after during his uh, uh, governments, you know, since he took over from uh, uh, Malcolm Turnbull in uh, 2018, you know, the uh, bilateral relations have been deteriorating like a free fall, as we have been mentioning. You know, this is really, you know, what actually had been, you know, catching us all, you know, by, by huge surprise. And uh, when we are talking about in the recent events, you know, I think Scott Morrison had also successfully diverted 
you know, the public attention from actual condemnation of the atrocities, you know, by the special forces, or, uh, you know, in Afghanistan to the, you know, a kind of like imagined enemy, which is actually China. So actually, as the previous uh, uh, commentator was mentioning in, in Australia, he was saying that actually now the focus of the public attention is now on China. This is exactly what he had achieved, you know, to be diverting, you know, shifting, you know, the blame on him, on his government, you know, on uh, the the Australian uh, armed forces to China, you know, when, you know, why, why, you know, such kind of the condemnation of atrocity to be condemned, you, you, you cannot condemn, you know, the, uh, you, uh, you, you, in other words, you should be condemning atrocities, not actually condemning the act of condemnation of such atrocities. This is actually what Scott Morrison should really be thinking about, you know, whether he is really ha handling, you know, the, the bilateral relations in a very sensible and also mature way. I think actually what Morrison has been doing in the recent months, especially, you know, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, he had been, you know, deliberately, uh, deliberately poisoning the bilateral relations. He had been taking every opportunity almost, you know, to be, you know, making, you know, a kind of like innuendo or even direct, you know, attacks on China as a way to, you know, intensify, you know, his, you know, position as a way of, uh, you know, a strong, powerful leader. This is actually, uh, in my understanding, very immature. Mm -hmm. Uh, Andy, let me go to you. Uh, we were talking about Prime Minister Morrison. Of course, he's from the centre-right Liberal Party of Australia. Uh, but China seemed to have gotten along just fine with pre previous Conservative leaders of Australia. Uh, Turnbull uh, came to mind. Uh, John Howard uh, was another one. Of course, there were ups and downs, but the relationships uh, were never this bad, as far as I remember. Uh, what do you think explains um, Prime Minister Morrison's tough stance against China over the past few years? Well, I think certainly uh, things have gotten worse, as our previous uh, panelists have said. I think there's two aspects to this. So one, uh, of course, is domestic politics and the rise of the defense establishment and certain think tanks as well that have been very, very bellicose uh, towards China. So I think that's certainly one factor. But I think we can't look at the Australia China relationship in a vacuum either. Because I think Australia is actually caught in a strategic dilemma because China is vitally important to Australia's future from an economic perspective. But Australia is also constrained in what it can do because it also is very reliant or sees itself as reliant on the US. Uh, as a military ally. And I think a, a better, brighter future for Australia-China relations also needs to consider the U.S. And I think this is one thing we've seen as the U.S. has grown more hostile towards China, that uh, Australia always has been uh, on the front lines, first into the breach, uh, first for, from Great Britain, who provided for uh, Australian security, and then the United States. And this is the cost in blood and treasure, in particular blood, that Australia has to pay. And again, I think this is why Scott Morrison is so worried about uh, Jolly Jim's tweet. Because let's not forget, too, that Scott Morrison comes from a, a marketing background and is known in some circles in Australia as Scotty for marketing. That maintaining this image, and I think uh, this talk of Australian values is a bit of a fig leaf. Right. And now the Australian public is seeing the true cost of, uh, of this commitment to the United States. And this is, I think, very frightening and unnerving uh, for mm -hmm. the Morrison government. Right. Um, Marcus, let me circle back to you. Economically, China, of course, is Australia's largest market, but politically, like Andy and other guests have pointed out, Australia is America's staunchest uh, ally. Uh, we're still a year and a half away from the next federal election in Australia. Uh, going forward, how do you think Australia may or may not reconcile with these two competing themes in their relationship with China? Uh, I'm not sure Australia will. Um, Australia, unfortunately, has had a uh, uh, you know, ha had a, a sort of a storied history when it comes to our foreign relations. We were part of the British Empire, the Commonwealth, Mother England, Mother Britain for many, many years, which gave us great comfort uh, and, and, and great assurance, uh, surety as, as we went our way throughout the world. Uh, the Second World War impacted on us in the Pacific, then we became an American ally, and then in the 1980s, 
and uh, 70s. We started to 80s do business with Japan and then Korea, uh, and we had beneficial trade relationships, but no enduring links. Australia didn't work at these relations, and now we have the same uh, situation with China. I mean, Australia has relevant, uh, has genuine security interests and security concerns. That that's that, that's fine. But you know, as our last speaker mentioned, you know, we've got think tanks. Uh, in, uh, in Australia, and, and you know, we uh, or you know, uh, people you know, uh, who are who I uh, are like-minded with me, we call it the uh, the the uh, China threat industry. They have literally mm. made a business out of inventing this absurd notion that China is an expansionist state and, and a direct military threat uh, to Australia. Uh, now, these people have a very very loud voice. I think what we can hope for is that uh, a strong foreign minister. Uh, a future strong foreign minister and a prime minister who listens to the diplomats. You know, I, 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 I'd say to my Chinese friends that that this, that these attacks on China, they're very, very interesting because nobody supports this this anti-China rhetoric uh, from the old China hands. So people, journalists who've who've lived in China in the last 20 or so years, they're all very much against this. There's no one, if we look at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, which is the nucleus, they're the, they're the ground zero of this anti-China rhetoric, this Sinophobe racist rhetoric, I might add. Um, they're not supported by any former diplomats. They're not supported by the business community. They are, in fact, uh, attacked from time to time by former military personnel. Uh, who see them as, a, as an organization which is just hell-bent on destroying a relationship. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you know, we, we need some strong leadership uh, in government and we need some people who, who understand uh, that we are going to have difficult difficulties with China uh, from time to time, but it's megaphone diplomacy okay. gets us nowhere. You know, we, we can't shout out and, 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 and use the media. But, and in fairness, and I think this is something that the, the, the Chinese leadership mm -hmm. needs to understand, Scott Morrison, yes, uses the media and particularly uses the Murdoch media to attack China, but that's how he governs. He governs via the media. He communicates all his policies, from economic policy to climate change policy uh, to, to, to health care, to age care, to education. He runs everything through the media. So unfortunately, this, this, uh, this, this using the media to attack China, it's just an extension of the way uh, he does business. And it's no way to govern, and it's absolutely no way to run foreign policy. But I just can't see it changing. And, and, and my hope is, is that, is that uh, you know, from the Chinese side, there's some appreciation that, that, that what uh, is being done in the way we're running foreign policy at the moment uh, is only supported by a very, very few number of mm -hmm. people, a and, they're d and they're conducting foreign policy in such a way as to hurt uh, a great number of people. Yeah, we have about one minute left. Uh, Victor, let me go to you. Uh, with Biden's America, his uh, cabinet forming, uh, what do you expect Australia's approaches, attitudes towards China uh, may be like going forward? Actually, I have great expectation for the Biden administration. I think his administration will need to reset the agenda for China-U.S. relations. And as far as Australia is concerned, I think the uh, current Australian government follow the footsteps of President Trump too closely without second-guessing, without using their own brain to make their own independent judgment. And I hope they will really very soon uh, uh, change their mindset in the Biden administration because they probably will be outsmarted by the coming developments in relations between China and the United States as well as in the world. Let's do the right thing. Let Australian government and the people do the right thing right now at this very critical moment. Victor, thank you so much. Uh, Professor Chen, Marcus and Andy, thank you also very much. It's a very important discussion. And I want to thank our viewers for watching Dialogue. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Until next time, take care.